Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening. I hope you are all having a wonderful evening. It was sunny out today and positive double digits here in Minnesota, which is, woo, it's almost spring. Um, but I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Uh, we have a really exciting uh, night planned because yesterday, I'm not quite sure how many of you caught it, was the landing of the Perseverance rover. So that's our topic tonight. But as people are rolling in and joining us, we're going to get a few pointers and tips um, to let you know how best to utilize the, the, Zoom, our, the Zoom webinar platform here tonight. Um, and for starting to get, kick that off, I just want to say that as a museum, um, we aim to advance collective understanding of both Earth and sky. And I would like to acknowledge the Bell Museum sits on traditional treaty land of the Dakota people. I would also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, traditional keepers of the lands to the north. Uh, Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Bell honor that knowledge, the values embedded in it, and the people who keep it. Now questions are my favorite part of the night, so please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send in your questions and your comments throughout the evening. Our team is behind the scenes monitoring and answering any questions that we can't get to live. So hopefully we'll get to all your questions. Some of them might be typed straight to you. And this event is being live captioned. If you find those captions distracting or not useful, you can hide them by clicking on the live CC button on your screen um, in the Zoom um, window there. But tonight we have um, a really exciting thing happening and we actually even have a really uh, fun guest speaker with us here tonight. Oh, so what I'm gonna do is I would love to introduce to you uh, one of our friends from the planetarium field, uh, Derek Demeter. He is the director of the Emily Bueller Planetarium down in Seminole State uh, College in Florida. And being in Florida, he has a lot of different opportunities than we have here in uh, Minnesota, at least weather-wise, and then the uh, how close he is to NASA down there as well. So we'll be bringing him on here uh, soon. Um, and so we'll hear some really fun stories coming from Derek um, and, and his, his different view of the sky, his slightly different view of the sky from down in Florida. So pay attention and look forward to him joining us here in a few moments. But we are talking about the night sky. So let's start with our star map. So like always, you can download our star maps from the bellmuseum.umn.edu slash star map. We'll go ahead and put that in the chat throughout the night as well, but you can see uh, the, the link there on your screen. Now we are gonna focus mostly on Mars tonight. However, there is, it's a nice clear sky out. So there's plenty of other things to see. So if you take your map out, you download it, um, take it outside, here's what you'd see. We have the outer side of our star map here. This is uh, our horizon. So if we, when we see a star that's closer to the outer edge of our star map, that is of course um, closer to uh, the, the ground. But the things that are straight in the middle here, like we'll see Perseus high overhead in the star Algol um, here coming up in the spring skies. Um, that's gonna be straight overhead. That's the zenith, the center of our map. You may also notice that Mars is not in the same spot from January into February here. It is moving. So earlier in January, um, we showed up, uh, Mars showed up closer in Pisces. But then now that we're in February, it is sliding over into Taurus the bull. And so if there's other, other things you wanna to see tonight, please pop them in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can, but we are definitely gonna focus on Mars tonight. And before I get too far into it, um, Tad, how are you doing up there on the roof? We'll see, we'll, we'll say hi to our staff members up on the roof running our telescopes for us tonight because it is clear out. So we'll give them a chance to say hi. Now, okay, we have a few um, few things coming in here. Question, is there an effective way to use a star map when watching via iPhone? Uh, the star map is just a, a flat map here. And so you can use it on your, your screen, your phone screen, if you will. 
I would suggest dimming down your phone screen so that way it's not bright white in your eyes if you're going outside or even covering it in a uh, thing of red cellophane or uh, another piece of red plastic to kind of dim down that white light. And then you can just take it outside with you. Um, if you are gonna read this, if you notice it here on the map, it is looking a little odd because east and west may seem flipped. However, uh, the map, star maps are not meant to be read facing down. They're meant to be held above your head um, and looking up at the sky. So if you do take it outside, the first step would be to find which direction you are facing. And so here on the uh, Bell Museum's observation deck, we are gonna be facing south. And so I'd hold south to my torso, and then I'd take the map and hold it up above my head, and that way east and west will be properly aligned. Okay. Uh, there are plenty of other apps out there. Um, if you are interested in downloading an app to your phone, whether it, it be an iPhone or, um, or an Android, there are plenty of apps out there. I don't have a particular favorite. So um, try, try some out, see which one works better for you. Okay. Okay, we have a few Mars questions already popping in here. That is great. Um, so one of them, which hopefully we will definitely be able to answer here is how long did it take to fly to Mars? Um, so that's a great one we're gonna put on our to-do list because I'm hoping Derek here, as soon as we can find him in our long list of participants here, he'll be able to step in with us and help answer that. Um, Tad, how are we doing up on the roof deck? Okay, he might be still working in the cold. Um, yeah, Tad is still outside trying to get things to work. Okay, well, Darcy, you want to describe what's happening up on the roof deck to us? Kind of how many scopes do we have up there tonight? Uh, yeah, right now we have two telescopes. Um, one is pointed at the moon, and I'm not sure what Tad has the other one pointing at. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have two scopes out. Uh, do you remember, Darcy, what, what cameras did he set up there up there tonight? I am not sure. Okay. Hey, well, hopefully we definitely have one that is our black and white camera. Um, and then Tad also favors, um, favors one of our colored cameras as well. So maybe we'll be using a combination of our cameras tonight. Hey, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Tad. How are you doing? <laughs> well, a little cold. Um, I, well, I can't see myself, but I don't know if my video is on. Um, so I'm outside. Um, we've got our uh, ZWO 183 uh set up uh that's looking at mars right now and then we've also got um a mini cam it's uh same Z zwo uh 120 zwo 120 if i remember correctly that's looking at the moon um so i decided not to do the cannon tonight i was wanted to try another camera that we have and uh, it's working pretty well um the moon is more exciting i'll be honest with you tonight oh do you want to start us off there i think so and actually maybe i'll throw it back over to darcy darcy's inside where it's warm Darcy, I'm a little jealous. Um, by little, I mean a lot. Uh, do you want to show us the moon, Darcy? All right, so Darcy's gonna, Darcy's got that view of the moon there and uh, they're gonna be moving around a bit. They're actually controlling the telescope from inside. Um, and we are looking at the moon. We're here at uh, nice, I believe, is this exactly first quarter, Sarah? Did, we, did you get this star party time that perfectly? Yep, we're usually pretty close to the first quarter. Excellent. Um, and we're actually a little tilted. I'm gonna, I'm outside, so I'm gonna mess around with this a little bit and see if I can actually um, maybe orient this in a way that people might be a little more familiar with. Because if you go outside, um, you're gonna see the moon and it's probably gonna be looking a little bit more, oh, I'd say a little bit more like that. Does that look a little more familiar to people? Looks a bit more right side up, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and of course, I may have just messed up the camera doing that. So we'll see if that was a, that might've been a dumb idea. Got a little blurry, but we can still see those beautiful craters on the moon tonight. Okay. Um, as we're taking a look at the moon, I do want to introduce um, Derek Demeter. He is joining us now from Florida, where hopefully it is much warmer than it is up here, even though we are in positive double digits tonight. Um, but Derek, go ahead, turn your camera on and um, say hi to everybody. We're so excited to have you here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it uh, says the host has stopped me from sharing my video. So 
unfortunately, I am still not able <laughs> to do that. But hello, everybody. How, how are you today? It's uh, currently we're getting a massive cold front right now. So it is crazy weather right now. It was 86 today uh, and tomorrow will be a high of 59. So, yeah, that's Florida for us in the wintertime for sure. Okay, well, go ahead and try your camera now. Oh, there you are. Now there we see you. Right. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, yes. Glad to be here. 86 to 59. That's that's a big <laughs> turn. I mean, um, yeah, you get used to it being in Florida. You get to and, and, and the wind gets in, insane for us in a, for astronomy. The winter can be amazing. It could also be horrible because our seeing conditions get really bad after a cold front, but after a day or two when the atmosphere settles back, you get some amazing crystal clear seeing conditions. I mean, it looks like there's no atmosphere at all, um, but uh, unfortunately we're not there yet, but uh, tomorrow we're supposed to be there. So I'm excited about that. Well, good. I hope you have a clear skies this weekend, but Thank you me. have a very unique perspective coming from Florida and then all your expertise and personal interest in all things NASA. So Tad, I'm actually gonna switch over. I'm gonna take the screen control back here. Um, and what, what, what I would like Derek to do is talk about what happened yesterday. What was so, um, what happened yesterday? Share with us, what were you doing? So actually the funny part is I was, uh, I was in with um, a lot of uh, field trips, virtual field trips yesterday. I was working with a group of uh, third graders from various different elementary schools, and I was getting them excited about this event here. And we actually watched the uh, the, the last of my, my school groups. We actually got to watch the landing of uh, Perseverance uh, yesterday or around 3.55 my time, Eastern Standard Time. So it'd be what, 2.55 your time yep. um, in, in uh, Minneapolis there. Um, in Minnesota. So um, yeah, that was it. Boy, I mean, when you saw everybody cheering and going crazy when it successfully landed, I mean, you couldn't help but smile and just get goosebumps and just you just feel this ecstatic energy just radiating from the from the internet from the digital world directly to to me. So and to everybody else. I mean, I, it was just incredible um, that we we officially did it right. The NASA officially did it, and now we have another scientific mission, um, a robot, another robot on uh, Mars. Yeah, no, I was waiting, I was watching it live and, and NASA's gotten really good at this, but nothing's a guarantee uh, when it comes to space travel. So I was kind of holding and waiting with bated breath as well to make sure everything worked just right. Um, so a question came in already of how long did it take to fly to Mars? Now, I think you might have a good perspective on this because what were you doing last July? Yeah, so, um, we have kind of we're a little bit we have a little bit of a privilege being that we're in Florida where we actually get a chance to go to Kennedy Space Center to actually see these launches close up and personal. And last time uh, we actually got a um, a chance to 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 watch this launch, um, and we were located on the Canaveral Space Force Center. Now we got to call it that way. Can't call it the Air Force Station anymore. We got to call it Space Force. Uh, we were there on that side because uh, where the Atlas V rocket launch was actually on the Canaveral side, not on the NASA side, um, because ULA, the United Launch Alliance, which is the company that actually built, builds the rockets and stuff like that, they're located at Canaveral uh, Space Force uh, Station. Um, and so we got, so we set up over on the causeway, which faces less than five miles from the launch site. So what we did is we actually set up a big telescope. We're talking one of those. And I think that might, I, I, I can't remember. I think you all have a, um, a Schmidt, right? A Schmidt telescope that you're yep. using. So we use an 11 inch model of one of these things. So it's a very large telescope. And we actually attached our cell phone adapter to it. And we were doing a Facebook live stream of the launch. And what I have here, if, if you like, I can share my screen. I can Please show do. you the, um, the experience that we have now. Just want to let everybody know when you're watching this, you might go, well, these letters are weird. That's because when we're looking through a reflector telescope, just like a mirror, everything is inverted or, 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 um, or reflected, right? So when you look at the lettering on the, on the rocket, it's going to be flipped and all that. So just bear in mind, 
that when you see the video. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. This is actually, I had to go on Facebook to look up the video here. Uh, well, actually, let me just go back. I want to make sure I have the sound enabled because sometimes you don't, it doesn't work. So I have enabled the sound. So you're going to see now uh, the person that's talking is uh, at the time my uh, my assistant, Justin Cirillo, he was our planetarian specialist. He's the one narrating this. And I was actually snapping pictures, still images of the lot. So what I could do, um, I, I, I should have got it uploaded in time, but uh, I do have some snapshots that I took. So maybe after this is over, I can uh, quickly run in my folder and look up those images and um, you'll be able to see that. So I was, I was kind of getting ready for the photos, getting, getting those really nice snapshots. Um, and Justin is, is narrating this. So let me go ahead and play it. So you can get an idea of what we were experiencing, what it's like to be close up to a, a launch like this. Phone here will uh, pick up the rumble of this uh, massive rocket. We are only about, I would say, uh, three miles out from it. So uh, you're, you're getting a great view there it up goes, close. There it goes. Here we go. So as you can see here, we are, that's what it looked like from our point Looking of view. Looking good. And you can see all of us snapping away. You can hear the snapping of the cameras, you know. But what I like to do is I'm going to shut up for a second day, because I want you to, cloud in the to, sky. to hear the sound Things of the rock. Things going to go up right the video over doesn't the beautiful do rising sun. We're heading to Mars. But yeah, so this was uh, July 31st, um, early, early morning, um, and it was already 93 degrees outside, high humidity. So it was muggy, it was buggy, it was hot, but it didn't matter because, you know, we're sending a mission to Mars. And um, so to the question that we had here, so it took about seven months to get there. Um, and uh, people always ask me, why do we need to launch this thing uh, at that time? Well, the, Sarah, you probably remember the opposition of Mars, right? The, in September, October, when Mars was at its closest, things were, everybody was getting excited about that. Well, a few months before, what we wanted to do is we wanted to shorten the amount of distance it takes for that spacecraft to arrive to Mars. Um, so what we wanted to do is launch the rocket a few months before Mars reaches its closest approach to Earth. So that way, when it, if it's on its way, it actually reduces the amount of time and the amount of rocket fuel and all that uh, for, for that. And so there was a window of, of time. In fact, actually, um, ULA was having some issues uh, with the rocket and they were delaying it. And if they waited a few more days... I think it was like August 6th or something like that. They waited till after that, they would have missed the window of launch, which meant that they would have to wait a whole nother couple of years to launch Perseverance. So it was a tight, uh, tight launch. Um, and I'm glad that they were actually able to do it, so. <laughs> yeah, no, so I, I'm sharing the uh, images here. We took around opposition last fall of Mars just through our telescopes here. We don't have an 11 inch like you have. We have a couple, uh, a couple of eight inches. We have a few tens, and then a, a, we are nine and a quarter is one of our workout horses. So these are some images of Mars we took last fall. But it sounds like Tad might have a live image of Mars for us tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing so that way, as soon as they're ready with that, they can pop up and share with us what they see through our scopes upstairs. And as they're doing that, we have another question about another rocket. So we just saw the um, ULA rocket that sent. Perseverance to Mars, but that's not going to be the one that sends humans to Mars. So the one that sends humans to Mars is going to be, uh, right now they're planning on being the SLS, the Space Launch System, super creative name. Um, but that's in its early stages with the Orion capsule that will get people 
in or beyond low Earth orbit. And then there's going to be some stops, hopefully along the way, the moon to transfer um, into some other type of capsule that'll finally then send people to Mars. Um, but what what kind of rockets have you had experience watching, Derek? As we're as we're talking about rockets that both launch rovers and humans. Well, real quick, if you don't mind, uh, if, if I could if I could share my screen again, um, I'm going to show you uh, a picture of the launch of Perseverance uh, uh, that I took while uh, while that that video was happening there. So um, just let me know if I can do that. Um, it says that. It, uh, I have to wait till you stop sharing to, to start. Okay, I want to give Tad just a moment here to share with what we what we see through our scopes upstairs. Oh, oh absolutely. Okay, yeah, I just realized um, I'm like, oh, that is Mars. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it, it's amazing how um how much how much in the last couple of months it's changed in terms of size, angular size. I mean, Mars was quite amazing to look at in a telescope during uh during that time, but. Um, back to your question, um, I have seen a pretty much, uh, I've seen the space shuttle launches. Um, actually, I got to see a space shuttle launch on one of my birthdays, which was incredible. I got to see it uh, only about three to four miles away. Um, I've been able to see the Delta IV heavy rocket, which is one of the more powerful uh, heavy lift rockets that is currently in, in, in you know, uh, here uh, right now. Um, got a chance to see the Falcon uh, Heavy as well, which is another very, very powerful rocket. Uh, all, all Falcon 9s, they seem like they go off every day, it seems like these days, but I have been able to see both the Crew 1 and uh, Demo 2 launches, which were the ones that uh, just recently sent up humans to the International Space Station. Um, and, uh, I mean, so, uh, right now, actually I got a chance to go into the VAB, the vehicle assembly building, which is that big cube building you see at Kennedy space center. Uh, that's where they assemble the rockets. I actually got a chance to see uh, the lower stages of the, uh, SLS, the space launch system. And, uh, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to, uh, get a chance to witness that launch as well. I'm really, really jazzed up to see, uh, the space launch system, uh, take off from, uh, from Kennedy space center. We've been definitely hearing about it for a long, long time here. Um, and Tad, why don't you tell us a, few, a quick short thing about what we're seeing through the scope and then um, Derek said he had a screen share he'd like to do as well. Yeah, and I did, um, in a sense, nothing against Mars, I love Mars, but I wanted to get it out here so we could see it. Um, you know, it, the images that we're used to seeing of Mars, even the ones we showed before, it, it takes quite a while to get those. Um, I know Derek is an astrophotography genius. I'll say I've seen your photos 742. Um, just as we're doing it live here with just a quick little setup, Mars is that nice round dot. So we're not going to see that same detail, um, but it is up there in our sky. So hope if you're wherever all you are watching, if you can get out there, just poke your head out, you know, dress warm um, and go out but, and go and look for it. It's a little bit down to the right of the moon. Um, so it's pretty easy to spot. Um, if uh, you're out there looking, you'll see it as nice reddish orange color. We're using a black and white camera here. Um, and what I'm actually gonna do is since, since we got this view of Mars here, I'm actually gonna take our camera, this is on our nine and a quarter Celestron scope. Um, and I'm gonna go try to find another target as well. Um, I'm actually gonna go try to find a nebula that has a name that's actually somewhat related to Mars and the Perseverance landing. Um, but with that, um, I'll turn it back to both of you and uh, I will stop my share. So uh, hopefully that, that, will, that will work for everyone else. Okay, yeah. So then, Derek, as you're switching over back to the um, kind of your experience when it, it launched, uh, one of the questions that came in is, is it blow your ears out loud? Is our rocket launch is that loud? Because you said the audio just didn't quite do it justice. So not that rocket launch, because the Atlas V is a very small rocket comparatively, but um, I had the opportunity to watch a Delta IV go off um, within two and a half miles from the actual mission control center at uh, ULA. Um, so uh, we were, this was during the Parker Solar, uh, or, uh, Parker Solar Probe, the, the satellite that's you know tra now uh, in orbit of the sun. Um, I had a chance to get that and we were off, the Perseid meteor shower was happening too. So it was incredible. I had all these politicians behind me and got a chance to do a private night sky tour with all these like famous politicians in Florida and other parts. We had the director of KSC there and it was, it was pretty incredible. But um, that launch was, I mean, my ears were ringing after that because it was just, I mean, it was like an earthquake. The ground was shaking. 
Uh, it was it was in immense, and it was a night launch too. And so, by the way, if you ever come to Florida, and if you had to pick one launch, one launch to see, it's a night launch because you go from you know dark to all of a sudden just the entire horizon becomes this orange glow, and it just you then all of a sudden you see this massive rocket lift off, and get, getting the chance to see that, and and uh, it, it's it's an, it's a it's, it's a it's quite the experience. So uh, that's some of these rockets can be very loud, and I can guarantee you once the SLS goes off. That's gonna be uh, that's gonna be quite intense for sure. Yeah, it, it's gonna be one of the, it, it the most powerful rocket we're building. Um, so it's gonna top even the Saturn V. Yeah. Um, so questions are been coming in. Um, a few people are asking, kind of, what is the timeline for putting humans on Mars? Kind of, is there a projected date? And do you think we're gonna get there in our lifetime? Yeah, so you know, it's kind of funny. I, I just had a uh, interview with this question today as well. It's it's definitely been on the hot hot you know pan for uh, you know uh, since Perseverance landed. And I would say you know being realistic. So it depends on who you talk to. So if you talk to say SpaceX and Elon Musk, he wants to have people on Mars within the next ten years. Realistically speaking, we're going to be talking about several decades before we start getting the first humans to Mars. And the reason for that is because things got to go slow. I mean, right now we're going to be sending humans to the moon in the next couple of years. 2024 is the, the kind of mission objective. And uh, it's a very exciting event. Uh, we're going to be having astronauts back on the moon, first female astronaut on the moon as well. Very exciting stuff. But you know we're going to be releasing this gateway, this space station type thing that's going to be orbiting the moon, where they'll dock and then eventually send landers down. We're going to kind of get our training wheels, if you will, on the moon first before going deeper and down to Mars. This is going to take seven to nine months just to get to Mars, and we got to wait every two years or so to actually effectively send people to Mars. So these are things that are going to are going to slow things down a little bit. So I would say probably realistically speaking, we're, we're still talking a couple of decades until we, have, we really seriously are going to Mars. Um, it could be sooner, it could be later, um, but I would probably say it's more realistic. So today I had a group of third graders uh, today, and I like to believe that they are gonna be the generation that's gonna, they're gonna be the astronauts. They're gonna be the ones, the third graders, the fourth graders, the, 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 that age group uh, or so, is going to be what I would believe to be the next generation astronauts that are going to go to Mars. Uh, unfortunately, I'm probably going to be too old uh, to go to Mars, um, uh, but um, you never know. I mean, you know, John Glenn and uh, or Susie, yeah, John Glenn, he went, you know, he was old, he went up to space, so you never know. But um, I would say that it's really going to be, um, you know, the, the, the younger children today that are going to be the ones that are going to go to Mars. Well, a question came in, uh, uh, this one's from Jen, and how did the rover get out of the shuttle? Well, on the screen, I hope you can, all can see this, is it didn't actually take uh, a shuttle. The shuttle, it was a very specific craft that sent humans up into space and kind of landed down like an airplane on a runway. Um, instead, Curiosity actually fit in this little capsule here, and you can kind of see it the multiple stages of what it did yesterday. Um, so it went up with the rocket, and then essentially it had to get dropped from outer space and it hit the top of Mars's atmosphere kind of over on the left here of this image. Okay, so that's that kind of cruise stage separation because then it had to come off, part of it had to get ejected there and then it's coming through, it's, it's barreling through Mars's atmosphere. Now, this whole process has to be done on its own because like Derek said, Mars is really far away from us. So it takes, yesterday it took about 11 minutes for a signal to get from Earth to Mars and then took another, 11 minutes for the signal, uh, return signal to get back to us. So it was a 22 minute delay from when we sent a signal to when we got something back. So Perseverance had to have been coded and engineered to do all of this on its own. And they call it the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes from the time Perseverance hits that top of that atmosphere to the time it is on the ground. And if everything goes right, we get that signal back about 11 minutes after it's already done it. And so these are kind of the stages that it went through yesterday, again, all on its own with even upgraded technology from when we did this before back in 2012 with Curiosity. So it hits that atmosphere. It's much thinner than Earth's, but a, it's kind of a double-edged double sword here where the atmosphere is not as thick as Earth's, so it doesn't slow you down as much. That parachute doesn't slow you down, 
but it's still enough that it's going to heat that heating sh that heat shield up to um, temperatures well well beyond uh, anything you'd experience here on Earth. So it needs that heat shield to protect the insides. But then after it comes through, the heat shield is, has protected it. The, um, we see the parachute deploy. And then that heat shield actually has to kind of get sent away kind of in the middle of our screen here because Perseverance is actually sending signals down to the ground, radar signals to figure out where it is and landing and just so it can land just right. And that parachute though, because of the thin Mars atmosphere, it doesn't slow it down to zero. It only slows it down to maybe about 200 miles per hour. And so from that, we actually had to cut the parachute off kind of over um, almost to the right side of our image where the parachute had to go cut off and then it came down in a powered descent kind of on reverse rockets, if you will. And from that powered descent, it finally got lowered to the ground on the sky crane, the sky crane maneuver. So not only did we use parachutes, but we used rockets and we used these big long cables to safely get Perseverance on the ground by itself. And then that very exciting signal that, that came back to us 11 minutes after all this happened um, was what everybody was cheering about yesterday. And not too long after that is when Perseverance took these first two images, one with its front camera and one with its rear facing hazard cameras. So these are the first images we got just moments after landing. So um, that answers Mary's question. Do we have any real pics from Mars? These are real pictures from Mars. Absolutely. Um, how long, so here's one coming in from Chloe. How long will it take for rockets to fly back to Earth from Mars? Okay, well, this is interesting because it does relate to Perseverance, is, uh, you know, Perseverance is the first stage in this. What, what is the goal of sending Perseverance to Mars, Derek? Like why, what is it gonna do? What are some of the exciting things that we're, we're looking forward to? Yeah, so the location that we've landed Perseverance in is called Jezero Crater, and it's an ancient impact crater that essentially um, it became a, a lake bed. And at one time, this would have been covered in water. And not to, if you look over to the, I don't know if you can use kind of a cursor here, but just off to the top left, you can actually see there's a river, a uh, river area that actually flows down into what we call a alluvial fan or a delta that would have deposited a lot of m minerals that would be perfect and ripe for fossilization. fossilization. And uh, if you can see me here, I have, this is a, we, uh, we attended a, a, a planetarium conference in Missouri. And this is, um, this right here is uh, limestone with fossils of shells and corals and stuff like that. Uh, this is about 400 million years old uh, that we, I picked up on a, on side of a highway. Yeah, you can actually, in fact, actually, uh, North Minnesota is the Canadian shield, right? You can find Lake Superior agates and stuff like that. That's about 1.7 billion years old. Um, so you got some really cool geology in Minnesota. Um, and if you go kind of down South Minnesota, you can find some fossils there too. But essentially the Jezero crater is a right place for possibly finding ancient remnants of either life or traces of life, either byproducts of life, maybe uh, essentially limestone, all it is is decayed um, shells and things like that, that have been crushed, you know, congregated and turned into rock. So if we can find those things in this area. This is one of the best places of, of uh, finding life on Mars. Yeah, so one of the great things about Perseverance is it's gonna take some of those samples and hopefully find some of those fossils you were talking about. Now, it's not going to return any samples to us here on Earth, but Perseverance first has to cache those samples. And then NASA's going to be working with the European Space Agency on future missions to get those samples from Mars that have been safely preserved once it happens here in a few months, and then return them to Earth. So we are hoping that those samples will come safely back to Earth in, um, in a good number of years from now. Now, it does take nine months, seven to nine months to get from one planet to the other just because Earth and Mars are orbiting the sun at different speeds. So it's gonna be a little while before we see those back here on Earth. Okay, um, we have some more exciting pictures uh, from the mission here. So I'm gonna share my, um, my screen again. And it's not only what Perseverance saw, but there are so many orbiters going around Mars right now is that we were using our other spacecraft 
to help monitor the landing, what happened yesterday. So over here, this is high rise. You can see in the kind of inset image there, it was actually tracking the landing yesterday. So you can see it while it was still attached, um, it looks like to the parachute part of it um, here landing. So I'm gonna kind of squeeze through here or flip through a few of these images that we've gotten back even in the past 24 hours. Um, and in the meantime, let's see if we have any other questions coming in because we have a lot of them, it looks like. Um, so we had two other agencies, global agencies, send some uh, spacecraft to Mars this uh, that also arrived at Mars in the past week or so. Uh, do you have any information or any fun facts for us about who else went to Mars this week, not just NASA? Yeah, so um, the United Arab Emirates um, re, uh, was successful with their HOPE spacecraft. It's going to be an orbiter. Um, its primary mission is to investigate the atmosphere of Mars. So what it's looking for is um, the Martian atmosphere is slowly decaying. Um, and we think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the sun's radiation is like a sandpaper. And it's actually uh, uh, at these, as these fast moving particles from the sun are hitting the, the atmosphere of, of Mars, they're actually stripping it away. Um, and you can see this by, uh, by looking at other things like MAVEN. MAVEN was another spacecraft that NASA launched and brought to Mars that studying the uh, atmosphere. So HOPE is going to be doing that. And China just um, successfully um, uh, brought a spacecraft to Mars. And unfortunately, my brain is, it's been a long day. I think it's, um, it starts with the letter T. I can't remember the exact name. Sarah, do you remember the name of the space, the the spacecraft is like Tio Ways or something like that. I am terrible at pronunciation. So yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, but I yeah, um, it will not come out of my mouth. <laughs> so but it, the uh, Tianyuan oh. one, Tian, Tian, Tianven one. It's like a, it's a V in the center in the middle. Yes, there. yeah, yeah, Tianven one. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you for reminding you. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it also has a rover and uh, we don't know the exact date of when it's going to uh, land, but you know, it, it's it, so this is actually a very, very exciting uh, time for for Mars. I mean, you know, not only does the United States have a mission, and also the European Space Agency is also working on a rover as well um, that will make its way to Mars too. So again, yeah, Mars is 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 currently going to be inhabited by many robots. <laughs> it's a planet of robots. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if anything, we are the robotic invasion of Mars, um, which is actually brings us to a really cool thing and gets us ready for an at-home activity that you guys could do if you wanted to. So here are some pictures of Perseverance, which is the name of the Mars rover. So there's many types of Mars rovers, or there's many different Mars rovers, um, but this one is specifically called Perseverance. We, la we um, landed one back in 2012 called Curiosity. Um, but we also had spirit and opportunity. So somebody had asked what's the difference between a rover and perseverance is one is just the specific name of this particular one that landed yesterday. But um, on board perseverance is the Ingenuity helicopter. So we can see it over on the left hand side here on our screens in the lab before it launched where we have the rover in the upper left image and underneath um, attached to it we have uh, the helicopter. So in the bottom left image you can kind of see it uh, kind of hiding on the underbelly of Perseverance. Now, what we're going to do here with this is that we are actually going to use this as a technology demonstration. And I say we, I mean NASA, because I don't work for NASA. Um, but Perseverance is going to drop the helicopter on the ground, and then it's going to kind of drive away. And they're going to test up to five different flights to see if flying on another planet is possible. Now, we, over on the right-hand side of this image, we can see that it kind of like has a drone-ish look to it. It has two sets of propellers that each set is about four feet in diameter, if I'm um, remembering correctly. And they actually have to spin very, very, very fast because Mars' atmosphere is so thin that it needs to spin very fast to generate any sort of lift here. And this is just a technology demonstration, meaning if we can get this to work, the next time we send something to Mars, we can have it go scout in regions that our rovers can't go over. They can go out further and kind of be our scouts um, that aren't quite as high up in the sky as our orbiters are. So this is a really, really intriguing um, investigation. But we're gonna put uh, a link to the chat in the chat for an at-home activity. And all you need is uh, a piece of paper. You can either download the template here 
or um, you can trace it on your own piece of paper. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and we're gonna make one, um, I'll show you, show you what we're gonna do. So there is the at home um, in the chat. There is a link that you can click on. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring you to a site where you can download um, a worksheet here. And you'll have two templates per page, or if you just wanna draw these lines out on any sheet of paper you have around, that's really all you need. Um, from there, what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut along the dotted lines here to make our helicopter. So I have one kind of staged out and I've cut all those dotted lines and I'm gonna fold these two sections labeled X and Y, I'm gonna fold those back. This is gonna be kind of the body of our helicopter here. And this is gonna give it some stability. Um, this section at the bottom of our template labeled Z, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and fold that as well. And that'll be the bottom of our helicopter. Now our blades are up here. They're not nearly as large or as many as the Perseverance uh, Ingenuity helicopter here is, but we're gonna go ahead and fold them in opposite directions. So it might not look like much, but there's actually a lot of engineering kind of testing you can do with just this simple helicopter here. So for starters, you can drop it from kind of as far up as you can reach to see how, it, how well it spins and how well it, it um, rotates here. Um, and one of the things that Ingenuity had to do is rotate those blades really, really quickly to get that lift off of the ground and into the very thin uh, Mars atmosphere. So what you can do once you have your helicopter made is you can test things. Does the length of the body of the helicopter impact how it flies. Can you adjust your blades? Um, maybe if you bend them at different angles at a sharper angle here, will it rotate faster or slower? What if you flipped them? Will it rotate backwards? And so these are all the types of things that the team building the Ingenuity helicopter had to figure out is, okay, how heavy can we make this? Because sending in a rocket, we need to keep it light. And also we need to keep it light to get it off the ground and lifting. And how do we get those propellers spinning so fast to generate any lift here? And so you can experiment with your own helicopter and see if you can answer some of those questions as well. How many rotations could it, could it make as it uh, goes down to the ground? And there's lots of things you can test that is very similar to what they had to test for building ingenuity. Okay, we had a lot more questions coming in. I'm gonna just check in with Tad at um, upstairs to see, uh, so that he knows we're ready for him whenever he's ready for us. And I know it's cold up there, but Tad, how you, how's it going? Not great. Um, I, our, our scope here isn't tracking. So I'm getting a lot of very streaky stars. And sorry, I just came, I, you just caught me as I came in and my glasses are all fogged up here. Um, so yeah, unfortunately I'm just getting a lot of streaky stars right now um, with our Zuyo. I was hoping to get to M42. The peanut nebula wasn't coming in either. So that was the okay. peanut nebula there. Um, I am happy to say though, uh, for anyone concerned who has been wondering if you haven't seen it yet, the moon is still out there, don't worry. It's still doing its thing. Um, I'll be honest, I could spend most of the night just looking at the moon. So um, you can feel free to stop this share at any point. Um, but we were showing this earlier um, and you know, it's still the same moon. Um, if you watch it long enough, of course, we'll see a little bit more of it lit up as it keeps going around the earth there. Um, and, you know, as we've been talking all about Mars, um, the moon is really the next stop, though, for humans. Um, and I apologize if I'm repeating stuff that's already been said. Um, but this is where we need to go next. If we want to get to Mars, we really need the moon as a, as a test bed um, for all these technologies we're building. All the rockets that'll take us there, all the space habitats we'll live in. Uh, the moon is a great proving ground for, the, for all that. Um, and it's only, you know, a couple of days away and a couple of days back, which is a lot nicer than than the seven months, two year journey, full round trip journey from Mars there. Absolutely. Yep. All right, so well, you, let you us can know. feel free to stop my share at any point. I'll, I'll keep trying to get this thing working, but I'll leave the moon up here for a minute. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I am gonna go ahead and uh, swap things here. So one of the questions that just came in was how is Perseverance powered and how far can it travel? So, what have you heard, Derek? How far can it travel in a day? 
So as far as a day, I, I don't know the exact uh, uh, information right now, but I do know that it's uh, powered by um, nuclear power. It's, it's, it's actually, it doesn't need solar energy like you have with Spirit and Opportunity. It actually uh, works on various different nuclear gen uh, reactor generators, if you will, uh, that uh, produce all the energy needed for the spacecraft to continue to run. So that, which actually has worked really, really well because uh, the problem with Spirit and Opportunity, the two rovers that came even before Curiosity, uh, you know, when there was a lot of dust, Martian dust that got on the solar panels and made it very difficult uh, uh, to recharge uh, all the electrical power needed to run this, uh, the rover. So this really helps the longevity of this, uh, of this rover here, but um, I could probably look up that information while uh, uh, you might chat something else. Good, but I think it's it, it, it can travel a, a great distance because of that fact that it has that power generator um, and the uh, so it's it's uh, it's going to definitely be able to uh, explore a very large extent of that of Jezero crater. Yeah, and we've had a lot of updates to this one since it's, it's modeled after the uh, Curiosity rover. And we're looking at a wheel here of Perseverance. And they've upgraded the wheels because that was one of the things that limited how far uh, Curiosity could go in a day is that it took a lot of wheel damage that they weren't expecting. So we took that information from Curiosity um, and we used it to improve Perseverance here. And if we go back to this other picture, this is what Derek was talking about in the back here um, so this is an image of the rover taken from the sky crane as it was landing yesterday. And kind of towards the top here, it kind of looks like this boxy thing jutting off the top of um, Perseverance. That is the, um, the RTG, the, the battery power, if you will. That's what's producing the energy that will charge all the batteries here on Perseverance. Now, like you, Derek, I can't remember the exact distance that it can travel in a day, but because of the upgrades to the wheels, and actually the additions of uh, more cameras than Curiosity has, and the fact that it can actually assess its terrain on its own, where Curiosity couldn't, it can actually travel, I think I heard, um, it can travel in one day what Curiosity would take a long time to do. So this is actually a very fast moving um, rover. Now it's still not gonna be fast, it's not gonna be going 70 miles down the highway anytime soon, but it is much faster than any of our previous rovers because the upgrades, because of that kind of self-assessing um, detectors and, and sensors that it has on it. So it's gonna do a lot of stuff um, on its own as it, as it assesses where it is in real time. So, I, so based on what I've read, it, it, it can travel about 600 feet per day. Um, so, and I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but think about as Sarah was mentioning earlier, you know, it's a 20 minute delay in commands and things like that. So, you know, um, and, and, enough, and, 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 and so it has some level of autonomy, but, you know, that's where ingenuity is going to come in. It's going to look for those, hey, don't go there. That's, <laughs> there's a cliff over there. Or don't go there. There's a sand trap over there. Um, so it's actually good that the space, the rover is not traveling real fast because if it were traveling at, five miles an hour, that could potentially lead to it hitting a, a big, you know, pothole <laughs> or a big um, rock and completely toast the, the wheels. So, uh, but 600 feet a day that, you know, you, you can, you can travel a few miles um, over the course of, uh, you know, a week or so, you know. Um, so, but of course, you know, we don't want to necessarily travel, uh, fast anyways. We really want to scrutinize. We really want to pay attention to all that stuff that we might look for. Um, the purpose of perseverance isn't to really cover a lot of ground. The pers purpose of perseverance is to really look for those, uh, you know, to be a good geologist, right? To be a good fossil hunter, to be somebody, to be a robot, to look for those signs of, um, of potential uh, ancient life, so. Yeah, and um, so somebody's asking, how did, how did the name Perseverance come up? And this is one of the wonderful things that NASA does is it will actually held, hold contests. And it was a student, I wanna say in like the seventh grade. It was a seventh grade, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wrote an essay to name Perseverance. And then it was another student, and I forget what grade she was in, 
she wrote an essay and actually her name Ingenuity became the name of that helicopter. So it's actually students in middle school who named these spacecraft that landed safely yesterday. I believe they were both seventh graders actually, I think. Um, uh, so middle schooler is awesome. <laughs> and I, I did see them briefly as I was watching the, uh, the coverage yesterday. So they actually got a good, good time um, during the live coverage of the landing yesterday afternoon as well. What an incredible experience for those, uh, those middle schoolers, right? Absolutely. And one of the things that boggles my mind here is if you look at this map here. Now, this is a map of uh, Gerizo. See, this is where I can't pronounce, things aren't coming out uh, pronounced right, but uh, of the crater here and just how we've improved our abilities to land very targeted on, on other worlds. So at the very bottom, we have this dotted line that we can't even see the whole entire outline of. And this is the area that we said we want to land the Mars Pathfinder somewhere here and had a very large target area. And then we got a little bit better. And Phoenix and then the one that landed, I think it was in 2018, 2019, um, InSight had a smaller kind of target area. But it's still large enough where it's not fitting in the screen. But as we kind of move up closer here to the kind of upper part of our image, we see that Curiosity, we can actually see the whole um, relative site. These are all relative locations. Um, on the map of how large an area Curiosity was going to land in safely. But then narrowing in even more, Perseverance had an even tighter landing range. And that's one of the, one of the I think, mind-boggling, but really, really cool engineering tricks about um, what we're able to do with these spacecraft is we, we can get a very targeted near, um, landing site here, and it's doing it on its own again. That seven minutes of terror, we have no say in what happens once it hits the top of the atmosphere. Um, so a question came in from uh, Amanda, it looks like, how will Perseverance get back to Earth? It's not going to. It's going to be there. It has a big battery, so it's going to last many, many years on Mars. Curiosity has a battery um, very similar to that of Perseverance, and Curiosity's battery lasts about 50 years, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but these rovers are meant to stay there. And so in that partnership that we're building and that NASA is working on with the European Space Agency, there's going to be other missions to go and collect some of the rock samples that Perseverance is going to take here in the coming months. So Perseverance will stay on Mars, but hopefully those rock samples won't. Uh, Jen's asking, what can the rover do? You talked a little about this, Derek. Um, do you remember how many cameras are on board here? Yeah, there, there's actually several different cameras. There's infrared cameras. Um, there are obviously surveying cameras like we saw when we this saw the very first photos. Um, this thing is going to be able to actually use infrared to uh, 24 cameras is the, the number. Um, but one of them is my favorite is the one that's able to actually dive down uh, using infrared over 200 feet underneath the surface to look for depositions and things that in the layers uh, where we could potentially see, okay, well, this is, you know, this, this could be a great place for taking samples. So uh, it, it, it's, it, it is a true laboratory. Um, not only does it have cameras, it has all the chemistry um, uh, analyzers. Uh, so when it does take samples, it can, it can look at these things. It can, it can measure the different uh, material found in, 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 that, in those soil samples. And so it can really know and it'll also be able to store those samples and then eventually leave them there for the next mission, which will happen later on, where we'll actually retake the samples and return them back to, to Earth. Okay. Another question came in, kind of where in the ellipse that we were looking at Perseverance's landing site. Now, there are two different images, so I'm going to have to flip between them. But if we see here in the Perseverance landing site, this solid line here, kind of in the middle of the screen, we can see it's the end of this river that's winding away kind of right above the words Perseverance Landing Site. Um, so we can see the delta kind of fanning out as it reaches what would have been an old ancient lake. So if we kind of imagine that, and I'm gonna switch images back here, you can see some of that, um, that delta feeding out into the remains of that ancient lake. Um, high rise here, we can see that kind of how it was spanning out. And so it landed very precisely. So I don't have it in the same image, I apologize for that. But Perseverance landed very precisely. I did hear on some of the feeds yesterday that one of the 
um, one of those, the mission operators is like, oh, I know where that is. As soon as the, the first uh, images came back, they, they recognized the rocks. They were scanning this whole region as they were uh, choosing this crater for their landing site. But there was the, the humans on this mission um, back here on Earth are actually recognizing some of these rocks and some of these features. So they know it precisely where per Perseverance landed in that very tight um, landing zone here. It is quite amazing. I, 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 am, I am quite wowed by all of it. Now we have about four minutes left and we're gonna see if, how many of these remaining questions we can get through. So Derek, are you uh, up for a rapid fire qu uh, question answer period for the next? Oh yes, I mean, I, we, I, you know, I, as I said, I deal with a lot of different schools all day long. So I love, I love that, that, you know, rapid fire question. So let's do it. Okay. Um, so Perseverance will be on Mars for a while. Where will Earth and Mars be when the orbits um, when it begins its journey back to Earth. So Perseverance isn't coming back to Earth, but when are, uh, when's the next time Earth and Mars will be kind of close together? Well, right now, I think the, 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 the goal is 2026 is when we want to send the next mission um, to eventually go and receive, receive those samples. Um, so th there's kind of a talk either 2026, as early as 2026 or as late as 2030, but we have to wait every two years to get to that next mission. So uh, the opposition of Mars, where Mars kind of catches up to Earth or Earth catches up to Mars, uh, it happens every two years. So we're going to have to wait. So, those, so right now, obviously, it was 2020 when we launched uh, Perseverance. So the next goal is to get that uh, return mission, those, that mission to pick up those samples, pick up and, and, and make its way to Earth. So we'll have to wait another two years to do that. So we're talking um probably till the end of the of the decade before we actually get those samples um here on earth okay we've had a few questions coming in about kind of terraforming or humans living on mars so what it, what are the prospects of humans actually living on the surface what would we need to do to make it in a habitable environment well first that, that's that's way way ahead in the future that's like science fiction at this point but what's most likely going to happen is because of the fact that mars doesn't have a magnetic field it's getting bombarded by solar radiation all the time and that's not good for humans so most likely the habitats that are going to be developed on mars for the at least for the first part are going to be underground they're going to be even in they're going to be in lava tubes or caverns or things like that that are underneath the surface because the surface can provide a, a little bit of shielding against that um, now the idea is that we're going to have to we're going to have to make the atmosphere fairly thick uh, in order to sustain human life, we need a, a decent amount of nitrogen, decent amount, you know, most of our atmosphere is nitrogen and we also have oxygen. Um, it's about 76, you know, 70% nitrogen, you know, 29 or 21% oxygen, uh, you know, 70 or so, um, uh, uh, nitrogen. So we're, you know, we, we would have to figure out a way to convert that carbon dioxide that's found in Mars into oxygen. And actually there's a, there's an experiment on Mars on the perseverance called MOXIE and MOXIE is actually going to do that. It has this little uh, device that actually is able to take in the carbon dioxide and convert it into oxygen. And this is going to be a very cool uh, technique for uh, providing not only uh, usable air for, for our human explorers, but also as rocket fuel because uh, the rocket fuel we use, uh, you know, in, in, in our rockets can be, you know, uh, oxygen. So uh, liquid oxygen. So this is, uh, this is going to be very, very exciting. So I think for terraforming, that's something that we're going to, that's going to be happening very, very in the future. So, um, you know. Yeah. Okay. So is it true that this rover has microphones and when can we expect the first audio from Mars? It does. It has the ability to hear Mars, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, I don't know on the top of my head when that's happening there. Uh, do you know, Sarah? Uh, I, I don't believe that they really announced that yet, did they? I don't know if they've announced it. I know tomorrow the mask came as we're looking at the image here, that camera that almost looks like the head with the big eyeball on it. Mm. Um, that's one of its main cameras. That is, that is I'm um, going to deploy tomorrow. So that's as far out really as I know. Um, but I don't know when the, the audio is going to Yeah, come. they haven't really didn't announce it yet, but it will be at some point and it'll be amazing when we, when we hear some, some soundscapes of Mars. Okay. Well, um, and the last one I think we have time for, because we're just about nine o'clock here, is Perseverance ever going to go find Curiosity? Are these two rovers that look almost like twins, are they ever going to meet up? They are pretty much on the opposite sides of each other in the planet. Um, and because you're going to only travel 600 feet per day, 
Uh, probably not. No, no, they're not going to ever come in contact with you. Or maybe one day when humans get there, maybe we'll be able to build a museum of all these robots on Mars and we'll be able to go pick them all up and put them in a gallery. So maybe one day they'll all be together for us to see on Mars. We'll have like a national monument on Mars for all these amazing explorers. Okay. Well, it is nine o'clock and I want to thank you all for joining us. I really want to send a special thank you to Derek Demeter for joining us this evening and sharing his unique and very special experiences of being at the Perseverance uh, launch last July and sharing his excitement with us from what happened yesterday. So thank you, Derek. We greatly appreciate you being with us, being here with us tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on and uh, glad we got to see the moon tonight. That was awesome. And, uh, and it's just only the beginning. So uh, keep looking up. Yes. Yep, and you can see Mars. It was that tiny little speck, um, but it is up there. It has kind of a reddish, reddish orange hue to it. Um, so I do want to say thank you all for joining us one last time. Star parties and our astronomy programs are made possible by the Ruth and John Huss, um, generous and generous do donors like you. Gifts of any size make a huge impact on our ability to bring programs like this to you in our community. Thank you so much for joining us this evening one last time. Tad is sending us off here with a share, a screen share of uh, the live view of the moon. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Enjoy the positive double digit temperatures outside here in Minnesota.